now to the gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. <clears throat> the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said to him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Dear God, we pray for your blessings on this word for today. We ask you to open our hearts and open our minds to receive your inspiration and insight that we might be ever better disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In today's gospel lesson, the man who preached against violence commits violence. The man who said, love your enemy, drives people away with a whip in his hands. What could have led the Prince of Peace to such unbridled outrage and violence? Well, the story begins when Jesus and his disciples go up to the temple in Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover temple in Jerusalem was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The temple had three distinct areas. The outer courtyard where all people were allowed, the inner court where only Jewish men were allowed, and the uh, sacrifices were made in the same place. And finally at the center was the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant stood as God's throne on earth. For Jews, the temple literally was the house of God and the holiest place on earth. Now, as Jesus and his disciples approach, they are filled with awe. But as they enter the outer courtyard, Jesus is horrified by what he sees. He sees people selling cattle, sheep, and doves. And there are other people who are exchanging money. The courtyard of the temple resembles more of a marketplace than a place of worship. He saw the worship of God was being corrupted. And in addition to that, people were exploiting others. He thought, well, how could this happen in God's house? Over the centuries, religious necessity slowly gave way to economic opportunity and the exploitation of people. You see, the law required every Jew to sacrifice certain animals for certain infractions of God's command. The only place in the world to have these sacrifices performed was at the great temple in Jerusalem. The temple had a monopoly on the reconciliation with God. This requirement to sacrifice at the temple was difficult for many Jews who were spread all across the Roman Empire. So it was expected that every Jew would make a pilgrimage at least once in their lifetime to the temple in Jerusalem and preferably during the Passover festival. Jewish pilgrims from all over the known world would come to the temple, and it is estimated that the population of Jerusalem would swell from a regular 50,000 to 150,000 people on Passover. That makes for a lot of people coming to the temple to sacrifice. It was far too impractical to bring a sacrificial animal from the ends of the earth, so people would buy a sacrificial animal when they got to Jerusalem. And there were plenty of people who would sell an animal for their sacrifice. Oh, for a price, of course. And usually it was for a very steep price. 
Furthermore, the pilgrims would also be expected to pay their temple tax when they came to sacrifice. Every Jew had to pay something to support the temple. The complicating factor was that they could not use any other currency than temple money. Foreign money usually contained the image of the emperor or of a god, and so it violated the second commandment to make no idols or graven images. The pilgrims would have to exchange their foreign currency to the special temple money. And there were table after table attended by eager people to help them exchange their money all for just a little service fee for the processing of the exchange. The commercial opportunities at the temple were monumental. All those Jewish pilgrims would have no other place to go. They were a captive audience. The merchants of animals and the exchanging money uh, could raise their prices sky high and they could make a killing besides the animals that were being sacrificed. So sacrificial animals could become a year's wages and exchanging currency could be a gap wider than the Grand Canyon. And I'm sure that the merchants excused what they were doing by saying, they were just providing a necessary service and just setting their prices according to the market. But Jesus saw it differently. Jesus sees that the merchants at the temple were abusing and exploiting the Jews. But more than that, these merchants had turned the holy temple courtyard into a noisy marketplace where the business of making profit ruled the day and was not conducive to prayer. There around the temple was pan after pan of the peddlers of animals for sacrifice and table after table of the traders exchanging money. There was a tremendous commotion so great that one could barely hear oneself think, let alone pray. Jesus becomes enraged at this desecration of the holy ground and grabs some cords and he makes a whip. And then he drives out the merchants with their animals, overturns the tables, pours out the cash boxes of the money changers. Then he stands before these vendors and declares, take these out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. The thieves, however, were not confined to the outer courtyard. Incredibly, Many of the people who were sponsoring these sales and becoming ever more wealthy were the priests and scribes of the temple. The people who provided access to the holy and were entrusted with the spiritual welfare of God's people were the very ones who were using their position to mistreat the poor so that they themselves could get rich. The temple had become a business for profit. The leaders of the people were using their position to make themselves wealthy and to keep power for themselves. They considered that, well, I guess God had put them in their position so they were being rewarded for their righteousness and therefore they believed that uh, making themselves rich was just exercising their God-given right. They showed little thought and consideration for the well-being of the poor who made up at least 90% of the population. The division between the wealthy and the poor was extremely broad. And basically, one either had or had not, and the hads were a very small minority who wanted to keep what they had and to get some more. Now, does any of that sound familiar? Could these statements be said in other places and other times in history? Or maybe even today? I remind folks at my Bible studies that one reason we study the Bible is that human nature has not changed in 4,000 years. The stories of the Bible are like stories of people today. Now you strip away the varnish of centuries of history, of civilization and technology, and the people in the Bible are doing the same things that people are doing today. That's why the Bible is still relevant. The leaders of the people today seem more concerned with getting themselves re-elected by catering to wealthy donors and doing the will of those wealthy donors 
instead of the will of the people that they serve. The wealthy donors use their wealth to buy power in the form of getting people elected who will do what the wealthy donors want them to do. Even with all they have, the ones who have want even more. And that was true in biblical times, and it's true today. But Jesus warned us all about the accumulation of wealth. He warned us that focusing on the accumulation of wealth displaces God and doing God's will, which be, should be our primary focus. God did not command us to worship earthly wealth or power. God did not command us to seek out wealth and power. And God certainly did not command us to acquire wealth and power at the expense and the well-being of other people. The priests and the scribes in the temple had little interaction with the common people, and so they were insensitive to the needs and desires of those people. The priests and scribes associated with other priests and scribes, so all they knew was rich man's problems and powerful man's problems, much as it is today among the wealthy and powerful. The hardship and burdens of common people were of little consequence to them. They really did not even see the masses of people as people, so they felt justified in exploiting them. Many leaders have done that all down through history. But that is contrary to what Jesus has taught us. Jesus said that we are to love one another and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The Apostle Paul said that we are to seek the common good, the good of everyone, not just our own good or the good of a few. Jesus warned us that the ills of the nation and the sickness of a society often come from a neglect of the needs and desires of the people and their, by their leaders. When the rich and powerful seek their own advancement above the needs of the people, the nation dies. It may be a slow death, but it dies. Jesus cleansed the temple for two reasons. The first and foremost, the worship of God had become soul to private enterprise. The temple was corrupt and had fallen away from its devotion to God and doing God's will. The second reason was that people were not doing God's will because they were exploiting other people. A few people were taking advantage of a whole lot of people. For each of us, the cleansing of the temple reminds us that we need to cleanse ourselves from the worship of anything that is not God. And we need to <coughs> cleanse ourselves from exploiting and ignoring our neighbor. Our need to cleanse ourselves from exploiting and ignoring our neighbor, well, this concern should be a continual process of seeking to love our neighbor and to promote the common good. So let us seek for ourselves a true devotion to God and let us seek the well-being of us all, the common good of us all. Amen. <laughs>